Hi, my name is Paul Holland. Growing up, they called me Boots. I was born in 1937 at the Washington Freeman's Hospital, which is now Howard University Hospital. I went to elementary and high school in Annapolis, Maryland. My address growing up was 106 Clay Street in Annapolis. Uh, I had a brother that was 14 uh, and I was 12 when he, he died, he drowned. My uh, sister was two years younger than me. We all went to the same high school, Wally H. Bates High School in Annapolis, Maryland. I went on to college after graduating from Bates High School, but I first went to Atlantic City to be with my dad who had divorced my mama. And uh, I hadn't seen him in six years. And I started out as a busboy at the Dennis Hotel with my dad. And it was great because we made so much money going back to, uh, to uh, the, the hotel to eat. We never spent any money on the street. But going back to uh, when I was growing up, and the reason why I think I have the entrepreneurship bone in my body is because my dad, when we were young, my dad was a waiter, my mom was a waitress. And my dad said one Sunday, I think you boys need to sell some newspapers. So we went to, he went and got us 20 newspapers, 10 each, and took us to the train station. Of course, we sold those in five minutes. So next Sunday, he got us 100, that was 50 a piece. So it took us about 10 minutes to sell those. So the next time, he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get 1,000 people, that's 500 a piece. So it took us about two hours to sell those. My dad quit his job as a waiter, bought a truck. He didn't have a driver's license, so he had to hire people to drive. And that next week, he got 3,000 papers. It took us from 7 in the morning to 12 to sell them. And he got it up to where we were doing distributions of 20,000 papers a week from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Evening Capital, the Baltimore Sun. And most of our clients were white because, you know, they paid all the time. So that was how I got my entrepreneurship. My dad bought uh, farms in, down in Underwater County on uh, Slum Lordy, on apartments up on Locker Street and on our house, which is on Clay Street. Uh, of course, when my dad and mom divorced, all that went by the wayside. So then we go off to college, and I went on a football scholarship to St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, Virginia, majoring in business. And uh, funny thing, I didn't know what I was going to do. And then when I got out of college, I tried to, thought I was going to play pro football. That didn't happen. And then I got drafted in the Army, went in the Army, and uh, lucked up. Oh, the first time I'd ever been on a plane, in my life, the plane caught on fire. So uh, we ended up landing it. We weren't supposed to go into Columbia, South Carolina, to Fort Jackson. We ended up landing in Florence, South Carolina. However, uh, scarce I've ever been. And uh, the sergeant said, you boys talking about you black boys, y'all get on those school buses over there. It's gonna take us to Fort Jackson. And you men, y'all get on those buses over there. They got on air conditioned buses, uh, and we got on the school buses. So that was my first punch in the stomach about racism. So I served my two years in the Army and worked at the Education Center and helped me get my master's. And I also uh, ended up going to Cuba, the Bay of Pigs, uh, because I thought about staying in the Army, but after that scare, we landed in um, Tomo Bay, and I said, if I get back, I'm getting out. Then when I got out, I uh, fooled around, and I ended up getting a job at Sears and Roebuck in a management training program. There were only two blacks in the country. One was in a management training program selling carpet and floors, and I was in home improvements. And uh, folk were coming around, because I was the only black in the system, uh, they were all talking about how good a, this colored guy is over in home improvements.
because everybody, you know, need awnings and roofing and storm doors and all that stuff. So I, I learned to do that very well. As a matter of fact, one Saturday, St. Paul's had a bus trip to come to D.C. to visit me, and they told the manager of the store that they were coming. So they tried to do me wrong. They tried to make me put on overhauls and, and stock all the shelves and stuff. But the, the black guys who worked in stocks, they got there at 6 o'clock that morning, and by the time the students got there, I still had my suit on, and had done all the dumb stuff those people wanted me to do. Well, the Urban League heard about me, so they came by one day and observed me for a couple of hours, and then they came back the next Saturday and said they wanted me to uh, come for an interview. I said, for what? Just we just like the interview. So I came down to the interview. The office was on 16th Street Northwest. And I guess after about four hours, they decided that they wanted me to uh, go in the insurance business with Metropolitan Life. Metropolitan Life at that time, 1965, had no minorities, no blacks, no Chinese, no Hispanics. Uh, so I said, I don't know what it is. So I went into it and they flew me to New York for two weeks training, which was rigorous. I enjoyed it. Then I uh, came back uh, to start actual selling and training. And it's a funny thing, here I am with a master's and my trainer was a guy who used to be an auto mechanic. And he was my trainer. And he had me going around in poor neighborhoods and black community, knocking on doors, trying to sell them $3,000 family plans. But there is a goal at the end of the rainbow. And I was walking down the street one day, and this lawyer said, you, you're Paul Holland, huh? you, you just spooked to sit beside the window. I said, yeah. And what that means for you young, that's the Negro, that's the white people are trying to show off and say, we do have colors working for us. So he said, I want you to come to my office on Tuesdays and uh, just see how we do stuff and we see if you what we want. So I started going there every Tuesday and Thursdays. And then what I did was he would introduce me to his cream of the cream clients, his doctor clients, his lawyer clients, his all the prominent people in the Washington area that were his clients. And I started selling them very large life insurance policies. And that went on for about eight years. And then I, was at a meeting and they said, you know, you get, you locked down because Metropolitan don't sell certain products. What, do you, what would you do if somebody needed long-term care? Or what would you do if they needed an investment product? What would you do if they need an annuity product? What would you need if they need a jumbo life insurance policy? I mean, that's a million and above. He said, we're going to introduce you to some people. So the white guys in my office were so jealous of the prominent clients that were coming to my office, they convinced the district manager to move the office to Prince George's County, out to the Gould building, where it would be inconvenient for those people just to drop by my office. So I stayed in that system about three years. I still had clients coming to me. And then I decided, once I, I bought my house, that it was time for me to take the risk of leaving Metropolitan and becoming an independent broker. Now, I never made $100,000, even though I was in the top 100 with Metropolitan Life. And, by that, and I also recruited over 100 blacks around the country. And uh, they would give me $125 uh, for the recruiting. Then I was at the Million Dollar Roundtable meeting. That's a meeting of all the top insurance salesmen in the world. I mean, they, they come from South Africa, Korea, South Korea, China. I mean, you got, you got to do what they call a million dollars of production. Uh, to be belong to the million dollar round table. So this particular meeting, a couple guys wanted to meet me and they said, uh, we do recruiting for New York Life, Metropolitan Life, Prudential all. He said, and we understand that Metropolitan Life pays you $125 each time somebody signs up. He said, I just want you to know, brother, each time we recruit somebody, if they stay six months, 
we get 10,000. But that was it. That took care of it. I said, I got to leave Metropolitan Life. And I started my own independent business. Where not only did I have one company, I had eight companies in the beginning. And then there were 22 companies that I did different kinds of life insurance, long-term care, and investments with. And I did that. I've been in the business uh, 55 years. Uh, here I am at 82. I don't do much, but I still sell. And I still do universal life insurance. I don't do whole life. I do universal life, which is more flexible than the whole life policy. I do term insurance, which is you're renting insurance. You're not building up any equity. You just like you're renting an apartment, you know, you're there as long as you pay the rent. In a house, you can miss a few payments. I also sell disability income. What that is, that's a policy that if you become disabled, it will pay you five years, 10 years, whatever benefit you pay. I also do long-term care. Long-term care is a policy where you might be home bedridden, you might end up in a nursing home. It will pay whatever you benefits you buy, and it will pay it as long as the benefits that you apply for. And of course, also do group insurance. You know, you, when you go, go to work, to, you, know, you see if your employer has uh, life insurance, short and long-term disability, and retirement plans. I do all those things. And as I said, I've been doing, I've been an independent broker for over 45 years. And uh, I've been still doing it. And I'll do it until I die. What made me very successful in this business is the work that I did with my clients, my present clients. And then they would brag and refer me to other clients. And that, and it would go on like that. I would have my business with referrals and clients would come to me. I didn't do house calls. they come to me. And the reason why they would come to me is because I was a one-shot place. If you needed car insurance, I would have one of my agents that sold car insurance, or homeowners. If we needed to do some legal stuff, I had attorneys on hand that would come to my office. If we needed uh, investments that I didn't have, we had stockbrokers that would come to my office and take care of it but I was the quarterback. I was the one who made sure that nobody steered you wrong. And that's why my successful career stayed the way it was because I didn't know it all, but I knew who knew it was something that I didn't know. You know, if uh, some people asked me if they had one word to describe me, it wouldn't be one word, it would be two words, staying power. And what I mean by staying power is no matter what the companies did, or if the companies decided they want to change course, go out of business, I stayed with my clients to make sure that whatever I did with them would be protected, and if we needed to move it to something else, we would. So that's why my clients stayed with me, because I never left them, because I had to stay in power. Until I die. Uh, I can't think of anything else I can say about my business, and it's been very good to me. I've been all over the world because of my production. I've been to Nice, France. I've been to Munich, Germany. I've been to Ireland. These are places I wouldn't pick to go, but because of the companies, it was a great experience. I've been to Hawaii about five times. I've been one year with American Health and Life out of Baltimore. I finished number one in the country. And uh, they never had a black with any company to finish number one in the country. But that was something I'm very proud of. And then with a company called State Life, I've never finished lower than number three the whole time I was with them. Some of these companies have been sold and, uh, or consolidated, but I still have a good relationship with at least five companies, depending on what I'm trying to sell. And as I said, I'm trying to uh, find somebody that I can trust to take over my clients. I have a lot of elderly clients and some of them are passing away now. And as a matter of fact, in the last six months, I've had over 20 clients die. 
and it's it's been good and bad. It's sad when you see somebody pass, but it's been good when you see the work that we've done. Did promise made, promise kept, and that's good. Hey, again, I'm Paul Holland. The name of my company is Holland and Harrison. The reason I was Holland and Harrison, I joined forces with a guy who is now deceased. His name was Gregory Harrison. He started out with Mutual of New York, and we became friends, and we shared ideas, and we also did business together. So I kept the name of Holland and Harrison. And uh, as I said, I've been in the business for 55 years, and uh, if there's any interest in life insurance, long-term care, disability insurance, retirement plans, investments, feel free to call at 202-966-0899. That's my 24-hour number. Somebody will answer the phone 24 hours. If you need to reach me personally, you can call me at 202-288-9763. And as I always say to my clients, peace and love. Promise kept. And that's good. Thank you. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank Paul Holland for allowing us to showcase him today, as well as you, the viewers, for taking the opportunity to watch.